chairman of the SEC litigation practice group at Porter Wright. Tom is formerly with the SEC's enforcement division. Uh, Steve, let me start with you. Uh, you heard us describe uh, essentially this case. Anything you want to add? or uh, I assume you've had a chance to look at uh, the complaints here. Well, I What's your assessment? I, I, I've read the uh, press reports about the case. I haven't seen the complaint that must have come out while I was on my way over to see you today. Uh, my assessment is, first, you, you mentioned something about the SEC and the U.S. Attorney's Office not working together. I mean, when the Securities Unit brings these type of cases, it's almost always the situation that you do these kind of cases in tandem with the SEC. Uh, so, so that's actually very common. But you're right, they don't often bring press conferences about insider trading cases. They arrest a lot of people on insider trading cases. Does that lead it, you to believe that perhaps this is just the tip of the iceberg? Well, you know, it, that's a good question. You would... From a, from a prosecution standpoint, you might not want to take down a case if it's really just the tip of the iceberg. People with means at that point can, can try to flee, they can try mm -hmm. to destroy evidence. So there's a lot of reasons that you stay you know, in the weeds, as we would put it, uh, until you're ready to surface mm -hmm. and arrest people. Um, so I, I have some doubts whether this is just the tip of the iceberg in this case. Rather, uh, because uh, the, the defendant at the hedge fund is such a high-profile person, they're right. trying to make a that statement. Uh, and they want to publicize this. That's why you see the purple. Tom, okay. Tom if, a, if, a, if a guy calls me and says, hey, I hear a big uh, takeover is going to happen and it's about to be announced, and I go and trade on it, but I don't know that the tipster is telling me actual information from an insider, am I just as liable for insider trading charges because I traded on a tip that turned out to be true? No, if you, pick, if you pick up a tip, some market information someplace, and then you go and check it out and you, you decide ultimately that you want to go and trade on it, there's nothing wrong with that. You really have to know or have some really good reason to believe that in fact that this is inside information. And given what we know about this case, I would suspect that that's going to be one of the key issues in this case is what did they know about this so-called informant and his arbitrage mm -hmm. scheme? Right. Now, the SEC, uh, Tom, <laughs> hasn't done that successful a job, has it, in extending it out by later. I know they've gone after bartenders who heard uh, a rumor from a person who heard it from a person who was uh, sleeping with a guy on the inside. And they went after a bartender, and yet in the Martha Stewart case, they were never able to actually win on insider charges. They won on the, gee, you fib to us when we asked you questions, right? Yes, that's right. Once the, once the information gets attenuated from the inside source, it becomes exponentially more difficult to prosecute the case. The criminal cases have tended to be more confined to direct information where the trader actually got the information. Some of the SEC civil cases have pushed the edge of the envelope a little bit farther out, but it does get more difficult for them. And then, Steve, Steve, if we know that the guy paid for that information, he's a dead man, isn't he? Well, again, it depends how you're going to be able to prove it. As a defense attorney, you're going to want to come up with some sort of explanation as to why there were those money transfers. But <clears> certainly, <throat> as a prosecutor, putting on my old prosecutor hat, uh, if you could prove that these guys were paying each other and showing those transactions around the same time that the information is supposedly being traded uh, and, and shared, that's strong evidence that you're going to use to try to prove your case. Tom, what about the environment that we find ourselves in now? We're, we're still recovering from the biggest economic a downturn that this country has seen in quite some time. Some would argue that it has ever seen. Um, and, and a lot of blame and finger pointing is going on at the banks and derivatives and trading. How much of what's happening now in terms of pushing to prosecute and pushing to um, execute on insider trading uh, cases like this one perhaps comes because of the environment we find ourselves in? Well, the environment creates a twofold problem here. On, on the side of the hedge funds, it's going to push them to try to push the edge of the envelope to make a profit because it's obviously harder, although the market's clearly been doing better in recent months. On the uh, prosecution side, it's no secret that the SEC has been battered from this scandal, that scandal, this failure, that failure. This past week they've been getting battered because of the Bank of America case. So they need a win. Mm -hmm. They really want to win, and this case looks like maybe they think this is their win. All right, guys, hold on a second. We're going to take a break here. Yep, we'll be back in just a minute. We're going to... All right, our, as we await this uh, joint news conference between the SEC, the uh, DOJ, and also the FBI on this alleged insider trading case, let's bring in our two attorneys who are standing by who both used to work for the SEC. Steve Feldman is partner and white-collar criminal defense attorney at Herrick Feinstein. Steve was formerly with the U.S. Attorney's Office, uh, the Securities Fraud Unit, and also with us is Tom Gorman, chair uh, of the SEC litigation practice group Porter Wright. Tom Gorman, how do you defend these guys? They've got... Uh, tape recordings, they've got instant messages, they've got emails, they've got a lot of stuff here. Well, what's your inclination, first thing that you've got to do if you're defending them? 
First thing you've got to do is take a look at the information source because all of this is going to trace back to the informant as far as we can tell. The question there is going to be where did the informant get the information? What kind of information did he give to the traders? What's the credibility of the informant? Remember, at the beginning of all of this, the informant's making a deal. He's got a reason to give the government what it wants. So his credibility is going to be critical first, mm -hmm. first order of business. Steve, it is interesting, is it not, the, the diverse group of stocks that allegedly were involved in this scheme? I mean, usually we will see it in one, maybe two stocks, or a specific deal that was pending and fell apart or went through. But you've got, you know, Hilton Hotels, IBM, Google, AMD. I mean, it goes, it, on, and on. It goes on and on and on. Is that unusual in your, in your experience or not? Well, I, th I think that speaks for the length that this uh, scheme must have been going on and the government was monitoring it. There are often cases where people have been doing this for years and years before getting caught, and there can be a whole wide variety of stocks. Uh, in this case, uh, they've traced this back for a couple years, uh, and so they've been monitoring this. They've been doing, according to their allegations, wiretap information. So what they want over the wiretaps is to find out as many people who are involved and trace this over time and see how far this actually spreads out and who the, uh, who the people are who are allegedly involved. So the breadth of the, the number of stocks speaks to the length of the investigation and, and, and what was going on with it. All right. We're going to take a quick break, gentlemen. Stay with us. We're waiting for that news conference to start. We will I have heard the charges against the defendants. And uh, I'd like to go, Tom, first to you, if I could. Our lawyers are back with us. Um, uh, Mr. Baraha just said something very interesting. He said basically that this is the first time that a hedge fund uh, has been involved in this alleged type of activity. Is that your recollection as well? I know we've had individual insider trading cases, but that a hedge fund per se, that struck me as unusual. Well, what he's saying here is that this is the largest insider trading case involving a hedge fund, and I think that that's right. They have had larger insider trading cases in terms of money, but right. not involving a hedge fund like this. Does it and make it more difficult to prove given the nature of how a hedge fund operates and how a hedge fund trades? I don't think being a hedge fund per se makes it more difficult. Hedge funds are, are not transparent, so their operations are always difficult to look at. But insider trading by its nature is a difficult charge for the SEC or for the government to uh, find mm -hmm. and to establish. Steve, they made a big deal about the wiretaps, first ever use of wiretaps. Is that such a big deal? Well. Uh it is a big deal in this way. If these were brokers at a, uh, at a reputable brokerage firm, they record their telephone calls. So every time a broker's on the phone making a business call, that's recorded. In this case, in a hedge fund, it's different in that hedge funds often don't record the phone calls right. of their employees. So they have to use an alternative. That's why it does make it tougher to do a hedge fund prosecution. And they compared it to the mob and drug cartels, the same techniques we use when it comes to the mob and drug cartels. Is this an acknowledgment that in the past, white-collar crime has not been treated uh, quite as aggressively as some have argued it should be? Well, I think it's an acknowledgment that they're changing the techniques they're doing to target uh, insider trading. Uh, insider trading, I think, traditionally came up in, in, in a more um, circumstantial way. You had people who said, I have some information, I want to tell it to you, and you had to go on their, on their beliefs, on their, on their statements. And here what they did is they put the time and the resources into doing a Title III wiretap. Mm -hmm. And that is an extremely intensive uh, process. Mm -hmm. the, you have to have people on the phones listening to these phone calls all day long uh, and, and making sure that they are monitoring the appropriate uh, information and, and, right. and sending it on appropriately. Hey, hey, Tom, it's great that they're going after this insider trading $20 million case. But in the meantime, you know, hedge funds and speculators and traders, they lopped billions of dollars off the value of the big bank stocks during the meltdown. We were all terrified. And some people on Wall Street have said that they feel like there was a conspiracy going on where they went from one bank to the next, Wachovia, Washington Mutual, and that they were orchestrating. And yet that doesn't involve insider trading. It just involved fomenting rumors. How can the feds pursue a thing like that, and should they? Well, the, the question that you're raising is about the so-called... Uh, short trading and there has been a lot of speculation that on Wall Street in fact people are starting rumors and then using it to drive down the price of a stock and then then shorting the stock and making a profit on it and there there's been a couple of cases that the SEC's brought where they've, where they've tried to do that. They have one case, in fact, where they found the traders with text messages. They brought the case. They prosecuted it. Those are probably even more difficult than the kind of insider trading case that we're looking at here because you have one or two people doing a couple of things, and you've got to be able to find them. Very difficult cases for yeah. the government. And as you might recall on that, uh, last fall, they, in fact, were doing a rumor sweep. 
Right. They'd sent